One of the things that's necessary when you are making circuits, and it's an inevitable thing eventually at some point, is to drive some sort of a load, right? Particularly a resistive load, because you're trying, and, and why is this inevitable? If you think about it, the only way you can deliver from a circuit's perspective, and deliver energy from the circuit's perspective, is by driving a real ohm, a real, uh, real load, right? Ohmic load. Because if you're driving imaginary loads, like capacitors and inductors, you're not delivering energy. So any device, that actually handles, transfers energy to do something, to do some useful things. Now, it may be a loudspeaker or something like that. Will present a real, has to present a real load to convert energy to the useful form. So eventually you are trying to drive some sort of resistive load. So the question is that, how do you drive this? What are the best ways to drive this? And what are the ways to do it? There are many, many, many different ways. And what are the requ requirements? Now remember, this is generally in the circuit where your energy transfer happens, right? And it's not, you're not dealing with just like small signals. I mean, you're trying to deliver power. When you're trying to deliver power, naturally, one parameter of significance is efficiency, right? So that's why we haven't been talking too much about efficiency so far, because you know, we are talking about things that are amplifying small signals. But when you get to delivering power to the load, then you have to think about efficiency. Even just briefly, I mean, so what we'll do today is a very, very brief introduction to some of these driver stages. And it's vast. I mean, just like the, the choices and options and things of that sort are vast. But just like, so we will talk about it briefly. So let's start with something simple. What are the good qualities of, let's say, a good voltage driver? What do you want a good voltage driver to, to do? Or more accurately, let's say, what do you expect its output impedance to be? If you're making a voltage driver, you want an output impedance to be low or high? Low, exactly, right? You want, it, you want it to be a good approximation of a voltage source. And out of the stages, the three stages of the three com primary combinations of transistors that we've used, which one does sound like a good option? It's not necessarily, that's not the only consideration, or we'll see the variations that use other combinations. But um, which stage is the natural one you may want to start with? Common drain or common collector, right? also known as source follower and emitter follower, four names for the same concept. Uh, okay? So what is the idea here? The idea here is that, for example, if you do a, you can do it in BJT or MOSFET or something like that. I'll do it for B, in BJT, which is kind of like makes it a little bit more general, but then we'll do it for MOSFET later. Uh, we will switch back and forth, doesn't matter. So let's say you have something like this. So you, let's say you have a supply, let's say you have a plus VCC or plus VDD in the case of MOSFET, a negative VCC and you're trying to drive a load, RL. And let's say you have a current, I1 or I bias. Right? What is the range of voltages that you can drive RL? What can you say about the V in, V out characteristic of this thing? So if this is V out and this is V in, right? what can I say about the V in, V out characteristic of this thing? Well, let's say when you are around the midpoint of operation, right? This current is flowing through here. What is the difference between V in and V out, roughly? The V beyond, right? It's a point, I don't know, let's say, whatever, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that, right? So at the VBE of zero, v, v, v in of zero, so this is V in, V out, you have something that's like negative VBE on. Say negative VBE on. And then as you increase it, it goes up. Of course, there's a little bit of a dependence. There's not some sort of a exact, there's a logarithmic dependence on of VBE on the current, right? As you raise this voltage, the current through the transistor is increasing, right? And its VBE is increasing because its VBE is really VT natural log of I over IS. And I through this transistor has two components, right? Let's call this IC. Well, IB is probably not a good name. Let's say IQ. Um, and then, so it's IC, so VT is natural log of IC plus whatever it goes into the L, load, IL. Or IQ, I'm sorry, IQ over plus IL divided by IS. And as you raise the input voltage, of course, your output voltage is increasing. This IL, the current through this resistor is increasing as you're raising this up, right? So this current increases. So this VBE goes up, but remember, this is a logarithm. 
So this change is not huge. So yes, it's not exactly linear, but it's not awful. And when does it stop? Does it ever stop if I keep raising this input voltage? Does it stop at some point? Well, practically, if my VCC, if this is driven by something that's similar to the VCC, I mean, running off of the same supply voltage, this, how high can this voltage go? What is the highest this voltage can be if, you're, if it's generated using other transistor circuitry? Let's say bipolar transistor circuitry. VCC. Can it even go to VCC, if you think about it? Or can it get pretty close, but not exactly? Because whatever is driving it needs to be going all the way to VCC, right? So that thing, the closest it can get for, for bipolar transistor is Vsat, right? 0.1, 0.2 .1, volts, because it needs to saturate. So if this is Vsat below VCC, this is probably going to be VBE, and, and this is going to be VBE below that, right? So this can go as high as VCC minus VBE minus Vsat, kind of. Of course, if you keep driving this higher, then VCC, there is a point at which you can, you can do that, but at some point you will also forward bias this. And then you go, this guy goes into saturation. So the output cannot exceed VCC minus Vsat in any case. Even if you drive the input above VCC, this, this output cannot be VCC, go above VCC minus Vsat. Because at some point this one will saturate and you will be at point one here. Right? Does it make sense? So from the top side, though, it doesn't, so yes, there are limitations, et cetera, et cetera, but it doesn't appear to be a problem. There doesn't appear to be a fundamental problem. How about the low side, going to negative voltages? What happens if I keep lowering this voltage? Well, less and less current goes through here. And so now, remember, now this time IL is going in the other direction, right? Once the output comes negative, the IL is going in this direction. So where is that IL coming from? This current source, right? Because this guy can source current. This is a good source of current, but it's not a good s way for sinking current. It can't, the current is not going this way, DC-wise. So what happens is that basically you cut down the current that this was taking, the transistor, and make it less and less, and you let more and more of the current to be carried by this current source. At some point, this transistor will turn off, right? Completely. The limit is that. So at that point, IL will be equal to IQ, because this current is zero. Which means that you can't go below that. If I take this and yank it to negative 500 volts, well, some other interesting things will happen at that point, but uh, it's not assuming that no inter other interesting thing happens, still the current is going to be IQ times I, you know, R, R, right? And the voltage of the output voltage is going to be negative IQ times RL. Do you agree? So in principle, this thing, can actually limit here. And remember, this becomes worse. So this limit can be IQ times RL. Now remember, if you're trying to drive a load and deliver power, this load can in principle be pretty small in terms of as a resistor, right? You take a speaker, and the speaker may say four ohms on the back of it, right? Let's say you're driving, you're trying to produce like a few volts across this. Let's say you're trying to make five volts across. A, well, let's say four volts across four ohms. What is that current? The peak current, if you have four volts across four ohms, is one amp, right? So now it means that this current source needs to be able to handle one amp. You need to provide one amp for it to be able to go down to four volts, right? And if you provide one amp, and if this is four ohms, yes, it will go down to one negative four volts. And a lot of times you do that. One amp can be a large number for certain applications. It can be a very small number for other applications. So it's not a magically bad number. But think about that there's another problem. What is the problem? Let's say I make this one amp, and this is 4 ohms, and I drive it to plus minus 4 volts, and I blast out some, I don't know, some music, and that's fine. But is, what is the problem with this approach? Do you see any problem? Because to push this down, I need to make either IQ larger or RL larger. Now, RL is usually determined by whatever I'm driving. So basically, it means that I have to have a large IQ. Well, this is not a bad thing, having a large IQ, but uh, apart from that. Uh, so if you, wanna, if you don't want to have a large current, what do you, what's the problem? Do you see a problem? If you have to drive IQ really high, then you're constantly 
you're constantly draining current, even when I'm not driving the full load, right? Full range of the full, full power to the load, because it's not all the time that you're trying to go full swing on the output. Even if you are driving audio, it's the shape of the audio waveform. Sometimes it goes to the peak power. It rarely goes there, but you're just designing something that is burning ton of current, right? It's constantly drawing power from the supply to deliver power every so often, right? So what is, well, how much power is this drawing out of the supply? What is the total DC power? So what is PDC of this thing? Well, it's the current times the voltage, right? The voltage is two VCCs, right? And the current is IQ. So it's two VCC IQ. That's the DC power that's being drawn constantly from this thing, right? What is the power that's maximum power that you deliver to the load? Let's say you design it properly, so this really goes, what is the proper design? You want this to be symmetrical, right? So let's say it can go to, so let's call this Vmax. You want it on the other side to go to negative Vmax, right? And Vmax is lower than VCC, obviously, right? We talked about it, it could be VCC minus VBE minus Vsat or whatever, but whatever it is, Vmax, okay? Smaller than VCC. What is the power delivered in this base case scenario where you have made it symmetrical so you can actually go all the way down, et cetera, et cetera? What is the power that you're delivering? What is the voltage swing on the load? Vmax, plus minus Vmax, right? That's the amplitude of a sinusoid. Let's say you have a sinusoid delivered to that. And what is the current? Well, it's Vmax over R, right? The peak current. So the average power delivered to the load is what? Is Vmax squared over 2RL, right? This is a sinusoid, so you get an average. So do you agree that the power, average power delivered to the load, you can show it this way, or if, you, if it suits your fancy, this way, right? That's the average power delivered to the load. So what is the maximum efficiency of this thing? Well, let's find out. Well, Vmax, remember, Vmax over RL in the peak, so the current is going to be Vmax over RL. So if I take one of the Vmax over RLs, that is Imax, right? Which basically, if you properly design it, it would be IQ. Vmax over 2 IQ in a properly designed way. So this is properly designed. If you improperly design it, it would be worse. It would be less. This is the maximum it can be. And if I ask you what is the efficiency shown with eta, well, it's defined as PL divided by PDC. Right? What is it? Well, it's Vmax. IQ over 2 divided by 2 VCC IQ. So the IQs cancel, you get 1 quarter of Vmax over VCC. And we know Vmax is going to be smaller than VCC, right? I mean, for in this example, for example, it could be 1 quarter of VCC minus VBE minus VSAT divided by VCC, which is less than 1. But what this tells you is that the efficiency of the stage is less than 25%. Best case scenario. Now, why is this a problem? Let's say you're trying to make an audio amplifier. You say, well, you know what? I can do it. It doesn't matter. I'm just, yeah, I will burn the power. I have, we have power. What's the problem? Is there another problem? Even if you had the power available to you. Would this present a problem? First of all, and remember, this is the peak efficiency for perfectly designed, for the perfect waveform, which has the largest amount of uh, amplitude at that maximum amplitude. So your waveform, if it's varying, this, you will not get this efficiency at all points. So even for, for, for an audio signal, it would be significantly lower than this, because this is that, at that perfect voltage. So what's the problem with having low efficiency? Or what are the problems? Yes? creates a lot of heat. That probably is going to be your biggest problem. 
especially when you're starting to deal with bigger things. It's not just that you're wasting power, which is not a good thing necessarily, but it's worse. You're making a lot of heat that you need to now take out. And that can be detrimental to the operation of your circuit. So that's something to keep in mind. So this is called what this, this is the so-called class A of operation. They call this class A amplifier. There are different class A, B, C, D, or combinations, something like that. So this is classic class A amplifier. Now, can we get rid of this by using a, let's say, for example, a PMP? Uh, and a current source. So if I make my follower with a PMP, like this, and a current source, and then RL to ground, would this solve the problem? If this is V in, if this is V out, would this solve the problem? Yes, no? Do you see any, is this different? Does it have a limitation in terms of the swing? N now you can go down, right? No problem. You can pull this down because the lower I pick, the more current will go through this guy. This, this is the PMP is good at sinking current. So it can draw a lot of current, pull a lot of current in. And on the low end of V in versus V out for negative V ins, you're fine. You can go wherever you want. I mean, as low as, Eventually, you will, at some point, you will hit some sort of a VSAT or VBE limit here or something like that. But anyway, you will, you will be able to go down. There's no limitation in terms of how much current it can sink. But now, obviously, you have the problem on the top because now it can't source current. So now it will be limited by IQRL on the top. Because even if you turn this completely off, the maximum current you can provide to this is IQRL. So the highest it can go is IQ times RL in terms of voltage, right? So if I ask you what's the efficiency of this thing, it's going to be the same. It's going to be less than 25%. Because it's just flipped. It's the same stage, just flipped. The limitation that you had on one end, it would be, and even if you design it properly to make the current large enough that it can do full swing for the load, that's fine. But remember also, there's another problem. Because your load may be variable or unknown. And if your load is variable and unknown, you say, oh, I set my current for one load, but the load changes, then it's going to be messed up. So the question is that, can we come up with a way to get around this, at least conceptually, that can sync and source current in an effective way? Now, we seem to have bits and pieces of the solution here, right? You have something that can sync current, and you have something that can source current essentially unlimited current in principle. How can you combine these two? Well, you just take the good part of this and good part of that and combine them. That's, again, a very classic nowadays old-fashioned you know, stage called push-pull. So you take this, and that's the first step. You just basically get rid of the current sources. You say, I do something like this. Now, what does this do? When the VN is higher, so, and then you go to an RL, right? The load resistance. So what happens is that your VN goes up, right? So let's do the VN, V out. If VN starts going up, at some point, it's VBE above this voltage, right? So once it gets above the VBE on, it just basically becomes that follower. You increase this voltage, the current goes through it. Yes, it will have some voltage dependence, but it's weak because it's a logarithm, and then it will go up like that. Now, if your VBE is lower than negative VBE on here, right? this transistor turns on. So this is negative VBE on. And then it can sink current. What happens in between? Well, the transistors are not carrying significant amount of current. I mean, in reality, this is like, like that, because these are exponentials, right? So it can sink and source unlimited current, and it will only do it when it needs it, right? When there's no 
significant input, there's no significant output current or, or current drawn out of the supply, which is great. You only provide it when you need it. You provide as much as you need. What's the problem? In, do you see a problem with it in its current form? What happens if I put a sinusoid into it? What do I get at the output? So this is the sinusoid that went in. What comes out, it's going to be like this, right? That's not good. It will distort your signal significantly. Right? It's called crossover distortion. Actually, they use it sometimes in guitar amplifiers or guitar like pedals, and there's a crossover that actually that generates certain sound, kind of sound. And the other problem is that actually a lot of sounds, for example, like S sound or Sh sound, if you look at it on the oscilloscope, they're not big like sinusoidal looking thing. I mean, the vowels are like that. The consonants are like little tiny noise looking things. So you put that in there, nothing comes out because it just gets completely destroyed because it's in that middle right dead zone. That's, a dead, that's called what we call a dead zone, right, in there. So it has potential, but it has dead zone. It has these problems. And again, like everything else, you start with something that has potential. You try to work on it, try to find solutions to it. So the classic solution to this is to try to get rid of dead zone. And how can we do that? Can you think of a way of getting rid of dead zone? Why is there, whenever you're trying to solve a problem, you have to understand where it's coming from. Why is there a dead zone? The dead zone is there because these transistors need to turn on. You need the VBE on, right? So if, do you agree that if I had like magic batteries, and I could put one here and one here of like whatever, VBE on, that, would, that problem gets solved? Do you agree? You want these magic batteries there, right? You want something that adds a VBE, so when you start at zero, this becomes a VBE on, and then you already have that VBE on that you need to drop to turn this on. Right? Agree? Can we make these magic batteries, or can, some, can we use something that generates a VBE on? Of course we can, right? What, where do you get the VBE on? On a VBE, on a base emitter, right? So what if we put a transistor here? So the idea here is to have a transistor. And they don't have to be fancy ones. They just can be a diode connected one. Right? So something like this is, the, the idea is to do something like this. But this doesn't work still, right? So, so just before you take notes, let's, let's think about it. Does this work? What's the problem with this? What, tell me what the problem is this, uh, with, with this, if I, if I were to make this. Now, you can also be kind of like fancy and say, well, you know what? This is a PMP, so I'm going to make it out of a PMP here to match that PMP. So I'm going to make it a VBE on to match that VBE on. So they would match better, et cetera, et cetera. That's nice, et cetera. But still doesn't work. What's the problem with this? It just does not work. This does not going to do anything. Yeah. There's no current flowing, right? Because if you think about the direction of the current, the base current of this guy is going this way, wants to go this way. The collector current of this guy wants to go this way in DC. So there's a tug of war between two things that can only be positive, so it gets zero. Right? So, and the same thing here. This one wants to go out, this one wants to go out. unstoppable force meets immovable object, right? So what happens? Nothing, zero, nothing, not, nothing will happen. So, okay, how do we solve this problem? How do we solve it? Yes? Right, provide the current, right? They're fighting over this current. And everyone says, oh, I want some current, I want some current, or I have some extra current, I have some extra current. Well, give them the current. Okay, let them have cake. Uh, so, 
So you put an I bias here to provide a current bias, right? You need to provide that. And how about here? Well, you can provide an I bias here too, or whatever stage is driving this, the previous stage can be the one that's sinking the current. And that's in a bipolar transistor, that's the way it's done usually. There's a MOSFET equivalent of this thing which almost looks exactly the same, right? You can turn this into MOSFETs and it will become the MOSFET equivalent of this thing. Now, how, first question is, what's the efficiency of this thing, first of all? Assuming that it can deliver current properly. And if you don't have to worry, let's say, don't worry, this cu bias current doesn't have to be as large as that, obviously. This can be much smaller. You can scale these transistors so that for the much smaller current, scale down current, it produces the same VBE, right? If you scale this transistor to be n times greater than that transistor, and if, then you can scale this current to be n times smaller than that current and produce similar VBE. Right? Because it's the ratio of ISs to ICs that determines the VBE, or ICs to ISs. So here's the question. What is the efficiency of this thing? The efficiency of this thing, for, you, you, if you think about it, essentially it's the current going through here, the first order, and the current through, going through here. What you're doing is that you're only drawing current from the positive or negative supply when you are driving positive or negative voltages, right? So what you need to do is to say, look, my I max, right, is what? At that point, it's going to be some sort of a V max divided by R, but it's going to be a sinusoidal, right? So for the, f for the first half of the cycle, it is going to be the upper half of the sinusoidal drawn from here, for the, lower, for the second half of the cycle for a sinusoidal, it would be the lower half of the current drawn into the, or put into the VCC, right? So all you need to do is just to determine, to determine this, you need to determine the area of this thing and the area of that thing, right? Now, if this is T, this is T over 2, the area of this thing is basically T over pi. OK? And that's basically what we use. So we can calculate the efficiency of this thing based on that. So what, when you do that, the area of each one of them is 2 over pi. So this, this current is drawn out of a VCC. So you have a VCC times I max times T over pi scaled over pi. So basically, you get um, out of that, you get a, a 2 over pi of current here. And then you get a 2 over pi out of there, so you get a total current that's 4 over pi VCC I max. So that's the power from the DC supply. That's the average power coming from the DC supply. Now, what is the average power delivered to the load? The average power delivered to the load is I max V max times V max divided by 2. I'm sorry, this is 2 over, two over. This is two, 1 over pi, so this becomes 2 over pi. Yeah, this is 1 over pi. For each one of them is 1 over pi, so you get 2 over pi total. Um, now, it's basically PL, it's I max over V max times E max times 2. Now, what you do, you calculate your efficiency to be defined as the power delivered to the load, so the power divided by the power DC power, which basically becomes what? Becomes 4 over pi, I'm sorry, uh, pi over 4, pi over 4 times PL, as I max cancels I max, and then you have V max over VCC. And we've had a similar situation, V max over VCC, you, depending on how the stage is implemented, V max may be a different value. Let's say in this exp specific example, it would be VCC minus VBE on whatever, divided by VCC minus VSAT. But whatever that Vmax is, this is the key result. So now you can compare the efficiency of this stage. So this efficiency now is going to be smaller than what? Pi over 4. What's pi over 4? Like 78%. So you went from 25% to 78%. Less than 25% to... Actually, it's better because now it only draws the current when it needs it. It's not constantly drawing. So on average, for an arbitrary signal that can change, 
and be different, this is a lot more efficient than that. Now, this is called a class B amplifier. Now, there are multiple other classes, like class C, class D, et cetera, et cetera, that we are not going to be talking about. The idea, though, for delivering of power. So, but let's talk about the idea behind them. If you want to make something 100% efficient, at least theoretically, something that's always 100% efficient, what do you need to do? Let's talk about that idea, because that idea is what matters. And there are manif different manifestations of that idea, many different ways of implementing that idea. But if you want to make your driver have be at least theoretically able to go to 100%, what needs to happen? Well, the power, think about this efficiency, right? The power, the fraction of the power that's delivered to the load, to the total DC needs to be as close to 1, which basically means where is the power that's not delivered to the load going? Where is that going in this example? Where is that? Where is that power when it's not delivered to the load? Where is, what is heating up? Yes? Comparison to the resistance of BJT. Well, it may be the parasitic resistance, but it may actually be the BJT itself. Because think about it. The BJT, you're, you're right, it's the BJT. Let's say when this voltage is halfway across the VCC, right? It's here. What is this voltage? Half of VCC, the other half, right? Whatever is left. And what is this current? Whatever that's delivered, right? So do you agree that the power delivered to this bipolar between the collector and the emitter is the current times that voltage? So that power is burning on the, on the, on the, on the transistor itself. It's not even necessarily the parasitic. It's just actually the transistor has finite voltage and finite current. At the same time, the product of the two is power delivered to it. It's turned into heat. Now, from that statement, what does need to happen if you want to have something that has the potential to be at least in principle 100% efficient? Yes? Your voltage needs to be off and the current is on, but the current needs to be off and the voltage is on, right? It's called zero voltage switching. So you want to create waveforms that have voltages on when the current is zero and current is on when the voltage is zero. And to do that, you need to have resonance structures. You need to have LCs and inductors and capacitors and all those things. But by combination of those things, you can actually create a situation that at least at a given frequency, not at all frequencies, at some frequency, and these are more apl applied in RF circuitry when you make radio frequency circuits, the, cir the actual the product of the current and voltage is always zero, while the current and voltage are not individually zero. That's the basic idea behind it. We are not going to go deeply into that, but that's the basic idea. Now, there are other ways to do these kind of driving, right? I mean, so, so it doesn't have to be done this way. If you th for example, if you think about a MOSFET stage, it's very common in a MOSFET to have a driver stage that looks like this. Now, this is not a push-pull, I mean, in the classic sense. It's, it's, this is diff it's a different topology, right? What is different about this topology? Well, these are common sources, not common drains. Push-pulls were common drains, right? Push-pulls were like this. And this transistor was used like this. So this is a different stage. Now, is this a fundamental problem? Well, it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do. The gain of this thing is really determined by RL, because RL is generally going to be much lower than RO of these guys. But the output stage is not there usually to generate gain. I mean, if you can, that's great. Sometimes it does, depending on what kind of load you have. But you can actually drive it this way. Now, this is a lot more popular in MOSFETs than BJTs. I mean, they do this in BJTs, actually, sometimes. That one volt op amp that Wettler, Wettler designed a long time ago actually uses uh, a similar state, it kind of, this kind of stage as an output stage, but uh, that's a different discussion. But it's, they're a lot more common in 
MOSFETs than bipolars. Why do you think that is? What do you think is the problem if I do this in a BJT? I mean, you can do it, and sometimes people do it. Not that it can't be done, but you have to be careful about certain things. What is the problem? Why is, why did, why is it that something like this, you see it more often in MOSFETs than bipolars? There's a couple of, there are a few reasons, actually. Right, so, so yes, I have a path to VBO, but I'm not drawing a lot of current, right, through here, because they are not diet connected. That's a good observation, but again, that's not a fundamental. This VBE is being in series. It actually has something to do with the, so what is different? You have to think about what is, so the answer to this question should lie in something that's specific to the transistor, right? Because there are some, a lot of things that are common to all kinds of transistors, and there are things that are specific to spe special kinds of transistors. So this obviously has to have something to do with the special things that are special to bipolar transistors. Bipolar transistors have these junctions, right, that can get forward biased. When they get forward biased, when, it, when this junction gets forward biased, it goes into saturation. But it also draws base current. So when you start doing that, it can mess things back here. There's another problem. When the bipolar transistor gets saturated, you dump a lot of charge into its base. Now, if you want to turn it off, you remove the input voltage. That charge needs to recombine. So in saturation, it's very slow. So it cannot actually absorb that charge. And that's what, those are some of the reasons that's not popular. But in MOSFET, not, neither one of those things happen. And as a result, you can actually basically use this kind of stage and use it commonly. So again, this was a very short introduction to output stages, just to give you a sense of what it is. I mean, it's it driver stages, power amplifiers. Um, output stages is a research area of its own. But uh, it's just give you some of the core concepts. Any questions? <coughs> 